All right. Yeah, let's review the uh, problem from our previous lecture first. So the problem is to uh, find the maximum sub area of the input sequence. And the maximum sub area should have the maximum summation. And we basically um, look at three cases. Okay, so the first case, the first two cases are uh, those conditions that the, the sub area is either in the left half or in the right half um, of the original array. And the third case is that the sub area across, uh, the sub area crosses the midpoint of the original input. Okay. And the, the first two cases are the uh, smaller instance of the same problem, but the third one is not. Okay, so we first solve the third case by uh, defining this uh, so-called find max crossing sub area. Okay, so um, we, we also, we analyzed the running time efficiency for this algorithm because it is uh, two consecutive for loops in this procedure. The, we will know that the running time of this uh, procedure is linear, uh, linear function, is a linear function. We can write it as big theta of n. All right, so, but this is just the third case. And for the first two cases, we will use a recursive way to, to solve them, okay? So put these three cases all together, we can uh, write the procedure for solving the maximum sub area problem. Okay, and uh, given the algorithm, we can analyze the uh, running time for this procedure. Okay, and we, last time I think we are at this point, we can write the running time of the algorithm in this uh, equation, in this recurrence equation. So having combined the lower order terms, including this constant term, the linear term, the last constant term, we can write it as big theta of n, right? So <clears throat> what's the meaning of the, these two times uh, t of n over two? This is uh, particularly important, right? Because the n over two within these brackets is the size of the sub problem, right? Uh, because we, given an input sequence, we compute the midpoint of it and we divide the input into two half. And each, each, each half is half the size of the original problem. So solving these two sub problems will need to, uh, will, uh, cost us two times t of n over two, uh, that many running time, okay? And that is the, that the, this equation that I highlighted now, this term covers the, uh, the first two cases uh, for finding the maximum sub area. And the, th the theta of n is the third case, okay? So uh, these, uh, we will notice that this equation looks pretty similar to, it, it, it actually exactly the same as the, as the merge sort, uh, as, the, as the equation for merge sort, okay? And let me start uh, playing the slides and share my screen again. Hey, Professor, just have a quick question. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so for the maximum subarray, the array can be of any length, right? Yes. But just as long as um, like the endpoints are included in them? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, that is a good point. We, we didn't uh, 
place any constraints on how long the sub area should be, as long as the starting index and the, and the end points are within the inputs sequence, then any lens can be considered as a sub area. All right. Okay. Thank you. Now let's look at the recurrence equation. Okay. So let's uh, be more comprehensive and consider the smallest base case uh, in which there's only one input. And of course, the time for that is a constant time. So this equation is exactly the same form for merge sort. And we now recall that we have solved the merge sorts equation by uh, plotting all the tree structures, right? Summing up all the rows and all the uh, rows sum up together into the solution in this form, which is a uh, big theta of n times logarithm of n. And we know that this is a pretty uh, efficient uh, uh, function in terms of growing speed. It grows uh, slower than the quadratic function. And which means the solution that we have, uh, uh, you, we have defined using a divide and conquer approach for the sub problem, for the sub, uh, for the maximum sub every problem actually reaches pretty, uh, has a pretty satisfactory uh, run, uh, running time efficiency. Okay. And do you still remember the, the brute force solution for the maximum sub area, right? In last week's lecture, when we first introduced the maximum sub area, when we talk about uh, investments uh, using the price, a price table, right? We, uh, some, some uh, proposal is that we only look at, we can just go through all possible uh, buying date and the selling dates combinations which turns out to be a quadratic running time algorithm, right? And so we can use the analogy between insurgent sort and merge sorts and can definitely find that using this uh, divide and conquer approach for the, sub, for the maximum sub area is a much better solution. Okay. So, so far we are, pretty much done with the sub maximum sub array as a uh, introduction example for the divide and conquer uh, families of algorithms. Mm -hmm. Then we notice that the divide and conquer approach for solving a problem uh, uh, almost always results in a solution in this uh, form which is a recurrence equation, okay? And we need to solve these uh, recurrence uh, equations uh, using a more, in a more systematic way. And previously we have used the recursion tree plot to, to come up with some uh, uh, estimated solution, right? So today we're gonna have, we're gonna introduce a more, uh, uh, rigid, more uh, carefully defined uh, method for solving these type of uh, problems. But that doesn't mean recursion tree, like plotting a tree structure is not helpful. And actually, sometimes if we have a tree plot, if we observe the tree structure first, it will be really helpful for, for us to obtain some uh, to at least to guess, to, uh, to at least have some guess about the solution, okay? And then we can use the method that we uh, introduced today to, to, uh, to solve it. All right. So next, in the next two sections, we're gonna cover the substitution method for our first uh, way to solve recurrences. And we, hopefully we will have enough time to cover the recursion tree method well, okay? And the 
third section, the master method or the master theorem method, we will leave it to Thursday. Okay. All right. The substitution method. Okay. As the name indicates, we must uh, do some substitution uh, on top of the recurrence equations. It basically has two steps. Okay. First, we need to have some intuitive guess of the form of the solution. Okay. And how we obtain such a guess is up to us. Okay. We can uh, use whatever knowledge we have. And the second step is to use mathematical induction to, uh, to, to basically prove the guess, okay? To prove that the guess is indeed the solution, okay? We want to find the constants to show that the solution works, okay? So the substitution is a step that we uh, replace the guess the solution for the function when we applying the when we are applying the inductive hypothesis to smaller values. So these statements may not be as straightforward to understand for now, but we will see the point of it uh, after we have seen a concrete example. Okay. So it is a, a very uh, systematic way to solve the recurrences and but uh, we need to first have some uh, guess about the solution to 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 start with. Okay, we we need to have something. It could be wrong, but uh, we need to start with something. Okay, so mathematical induction is the key uh, technique here. So before we officially introduce the substitution method, let's do a brief review about the mathematical induction method, okay? So the next two slides are not related to, not, not directly related to the substitution method, but it is a technique that, it is a way of thinking about proving some problems in mathematics that uh, we need to uh, know about. All right. So uh, look at this problem, okay? So, given an integer number n, we want to prove that three to the power of n minus one is a multiple of two, okay? So if we are asked to, to prove this uh, uh, mathematical problem, then there, there are several ways to solve it, okay? But the, the, the method we gonna use is the mathematical induction. So in order to do the induction, we need to start with some base case or boundary case. So in this case, we can say, uh, we want to check if this uh, statement is true for n equals one, okay? So three to the power of one minus one is two, which means it is indeed true. Okay, which is a good start, okay? But we are not, not that, not there yet because we want to prove the problem, want to prove the statement for all the numbers, okay? But we have a good start. All right, so then the induction starts with an assumption, okay? Please notice that the second step is to assume that the claim is true for an arbitrary number n equals k, okay? We need to hold some assumption that the, the statement is true, which means three to the power of k minus one is a multiple of two. And we'll take a step further. So for n equals zero, I see a question just now. So for n equals zero, I think it's also true. And three to the power of zero is one. Uh, one minus one is zero. And zero can also uh, considered as a multiple of two, okay? Though that's not very important in this case. We are just want to 
showcase how to use the uh, induction. Okay, so uh, after we have assumed that the statement is true for some k, then we can take one more step further. Then we need to prove the statement is also true for k plus one, right? We move from k to k plus one. And the case for n equals k plus one is that three to the power of k plus one minus one. We want to show that this is also a multiple, uh, multiple of two, okay? And this is quite doable because if we expand um, three to the power of k plus one minus one, it's basically three times three to the, uh, three times three to the power of k minus one. And we uh, can divide, we can split this uh, three times into two times plus one times, right? And here we have two parts adding together, okay? And for these two parts, because the three to the power of k minus one, we know it is a multiple of two because this is our assumption, okay? We assume that this is true for k. And this first term is apparently a multiple of two because it is two times something, right? It's for sure to be a multiple of two. So when we add up, two parts together while the each part is a multiple of two, we are for sure to get something that itself is a multiple of two, okay? So we can basically prove that the case for n equals k plus one is also true for this statement, okay? You see, we start from an assumption from uh, of n equals k, to the step for n equals k plus one, okay? So given these two steps, we can do, we can have the proof for all integer numbers because, because we can start from n equals one to n equals two to n equals three to four and to, and to the infinity, right? And that means we can prove it for all the integer numbers, uh, uh, for all the integer numbers, okay? And we're done, right? We're happy about that because we have proved that three to the power of anything minus one is always a multiple of two. And hopefully this uh, shows the, the essence of uh, mathematical induction, okay? We need to, let's go to the next slide. There's a uh, more abstract summary, okay? So the style of solving a problem uh, using mathematical induction is that uh, we, we first check the, the boundary case. We want to see uh, if the statements we want to prove is true for some base condition. For example, n equals n zero. And the, the next step is to start from some assumption. We assume that this is true for some for some condition for n equals k. And then we need to show that the condition is still true for a relatively larger step, for example, k plus one, okay? But these k and k plus one are something that we can arbitrarily, arbitrarily choose. As long as we can show that the condition holds uh, from some smaller, from some smaller assumptions, okay? Or in another way, the smaller assumptions can lead to the larger assumptions. Then we can basically prove that the statement is true for all the cases, okay? All right, that's uh, something we're gonna use in the substitution method, okay? And uh, these two slides are newly added to the PDF files uh, on Canvas and I updated today. So if you don't find it in the old PDF, you can go ahead and download the new one. All right. Okay, so let's look at the, the substitution method. 
right? So remember our goal for using substitution method is to solve the recurrence, okay? Um, consider this uh, recurrence, uh, which is pretty much the same one as the merged sorts and the sub array algorithm, the maximum sub array algorithm. And the little bit difference is there, right? Because uh, it is, there's a floor symbol because here we don't require the n to be a number dividable by, by two, okay? Okay, and uh, also uh, we rewrite this part, we rewrite the big theta of n into some specific function that is uh, that is the same order as the general linear function. Okay, so we have a one, basically give it a, a constant coefficient, which makes us uh, makes it easier to 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 do the mathematical proof. Okay, so uh, we'll use an upper bound which is the big O uh, notation as an example. Okay, so uh, maybe big O is relatively easier to, to prove uh, than the big theta because uh, remember the big theta is something like a, like a sandwich condition that we want to prove the function lies between the lower bound and the upper bound, which is harder than simply to prove that to, to only prove the upper bound, right? So to prove an upper bound, the big O notation is a relatively easier start than to uh, prove the, immediate, immediately prove the big theta notation, okay? So let's make our uh, guess first, right? Based on our knowledge about merge sorts, we can immediately guess that, well, it has the same form as the merge sort. It must have the same solution. So we can guess the solution is big O of n times uh, logarithm of n. Okay. So, all right. Given this guess, the what this solution means is that now we are referring to the definition of big O. Okay. So the big O definition requires us to prove that the function t of n should be smaller than or equal to c times n times logarithm of n for some constant c that is positive and for some points n that is greater than n zero. Okay, so that is the definition of big O. We need to find such a C and such an N zero show so that the function is bounded by C times N times logarithm of N. And only with that satisfied, we can claim the function uh, has such a big O uh, upper bound. Okay. So now let's uh, step by step to, uh, let's carry out the mathematical induction. Uh, gradually. So we can assume that these bounds holds for some smaller number, some smaller positive number. In particular, we are interested in this uh, n divided by two to the floor, okay, because it appears in the recurrence. Okay, let's assume that it is true for the smaller case, right? So if it is true for the smaller case, which means that the T of n over two to the floor should be smaller than and equal to C times this uh, smaller number times logarithm of this smaller number. Okay, so if we pay attention to this inequality, it is just the result of substitutes of substituting the n over two to the floor to the original inequality here. We just replace all the n's with the n over two uh, to the floor, right? Nothing else has changed. We just do the substitution, okay? Uh, because we, may, we assume that this is true for the smaller case, okay? All right. So now we need to substitute this inequality into the original 
recurrence. Oops. Okay. We will sub need to substitute this inequality into the right part of this original recurrence. And we will get something that's really interesting. Okay, after the substitution, we will have, right? T of N should be smaller than or equal to two times this thing, right? This is no problem, right? Because we substitute uh, the T of N over two uh, to the floor with this inequality, okay? Now this uh, equal symbols become the less than or equal to. Okay, and we can further write the right part. Okay, now we can remove the floors symbol because the floor always uh, results in some smaller values. Okay, so we can further uh, chain the right parts uh, uh, of the equality. Okay, and by removing the floors. And then if we uh, expand the logarithm function, okay? So this step, I may be a little bit uh, too fast because two times this thing divided by two will eliminate the two, right? So the outside term will only be C times N. And the logarithm of a division can be rewrite as a logarithm of the numerator minus the logarithm of the denominator, okay? So this term becomes C times N uh, times logarithm of N minus C times N times logarithm of two, okay? So uh, we basically simplify the equation furthermore. And uh, because we can, Oh, we are talking about the logarithm with two with base two. Okay, so we can uh, have logarithm of two equals one, and that will merge with the last linear term, which is uh, one minus c uh, times n. So yeah, all right, we have a a uh, pretty simplified uh, term for uh, the equal for the solution of T of N. And uh, we, we, we should note that this is uh, connected by the inequality less than or equal to, okay? And it is also inequality here and the two equalities uh, here, okay? All right, so this is the result after the, after the substitution, okay? So now let's go back to our proof, okay? Because we assume that the solution is true for the smaller case, which is, uh, which is this one, the smaller case. And we hope, we, we wish to prove that the solution also is also true for the original case, for the larger case, T of N, okay? So we hope that this thing is also less than or equal to this form because this is the solution we hope to get, right? So we can put the uh, uh, C times N times logarithm of N on the right of this less than or equal to condition, all right? So what does that mean? So if we look at the two sides of this inequality, right, we, are, we need to look at this inequality now. How do we make sure that this is always true? Okay, how do we make sure that this is true? Right, it is exactly the same form which I underscored, okay? So all we need to do is to make sure that these term should be less than or equal to zero, 
okay? Which means that the C must be greater, uh, greater than or equal to one, okay? All right, so we, we are happy about that. So let's uh, start again. Let's uh, maybe start from the previous slide, from the uh, end of the previous slide. So we start with some assumption, which is for a smaller case, okay? For a smaller case. And this is our assumption. And we substitute this assumption into the uh, original recurrence. And we have by several steps of uh, uh, simplification by moving around the, the mathematical uh, equations, we can have the solution uh, for, uh, we can have the condition for uh, the solution also holds for the original, for the larger problem, okay, for the original problem. And the condition we need to satisfy is that C must be greater than one. Okay, so this is something we can satisfy. Okay, so that means as long as we choose the C that is greater than one, then our what we can achieve is that given a smaller valid solution, we can uh, use mathematical induction to prove that the solution also holds for a larger problem. Okay, and that is our first step of mathematical induction. Because there's one more step to do. We need to uh, find that the base case exists. Okay, so the base case is the starting points of the mathematical induction. Okay, we need to find some specific boundaries, okay, as the starting point for the mathematical induction. Okay, so what about the smallest uh, base case, like n equals one? Okay, let's do the examination. But unfortunately, in this case, t of one, according to the recurrence equation, t of one equals one. Okay, but the c times one times logarithm of one is zero. Okay, which means it violates the solution because the solution requires us that the t of n should be smaller than c times n times logarithm of n. So, so the n equals one cannot be the starting, cannot be the boundary condition. We need to find something new, okay? We need to find a new boundary condition. All right, that's uh, no worry. We can, we can, if one doesn't work, we can go to two, right? If two doesn't work, we go to three. We can always find the points that, uh, uh, it's uh, satisfied, uh, as long as this is the correct solution, right? All right, so, so we, in, in this particular case, we, we can uh, observe that uh, when the n is greater than three, then no recurrence does not directly, uh, the recurrence does not directly uh, depend on T of one, because T of one is a violation, we want to avoid T of one, okay? So, uh, so we can, what we can actually do is to examine the uh, t of uh, n, n equals two and n equals three as the boundary case, okay? So for, for instance, the t of two is two times t of one plus two, which is four, okay? And the t of three uh, is uh, two times t of one plus three. Uh, equals five. So which is the, basically by the definition of the recurrence equations, we can have these boundary cases, okay? T of two and T equals three. So as long as T of two is smaller than the C times two times logarithm of two, and T of three is smaller than c times three times logarithm of three hold, as long as this blue inequality and the red inequality hold, then we have proven the boundary conditions, okay? Which means our c should be larger than two, okay? Because the blue inequality says that four should be smaller than or equal to c times two times one. 
So C should be greater than two. And if we solve this red inequality, we will find that the C should be greater than some smaller number. Okay. So altogether, we should have C that's greater than two. Okay. So this is a more strict condition than the previous condition. The previous condition says that uh, as long as C is greater than one, then we can uh, uh, infer from the smaller case to a larger case, okay? But the condition, but the, the requirements for finding boundary conditions is that the C should be greater than two, which is a strictly more strict uh, requirement. Okay. So, um, altogether, put these slides and the previous two slides together, we can say that uh, this general solution, T of N, is smaller than or equal to c times n times logarithm of n uh, must hold with such c's and such n's okay n equals two because because t of two is our uh, smallest uh, smallest uh, boundary case okay but t of one is not okay so we need to choose n zero and n n zero equals two instead of one and yeah, that's the a complete example of using uh, substitution method to prove the uh, to actually find the solution for for uh, recurrence equations. Yeah, and I think you have all noticed that we are not actually uh, finding the. Uh, composing the solution from scratch, but we start from some guess, right? Uh, we, we, we have the guess that the solution uh, should be n times log of n. Uh, based, our, based on our previous experience, that's uh, uh, by plotting the tree structure for merge sorts, we have such a, such a estimated solution. But now we use mathematical uh, induction to have a strict proof that this n times log of, of n is indeed the solution uh, for the for the for the recurrence. All right. Okay. So uh, if the if I think this this if if this is the first time you uh, come across this way of solving the mathematical induction problem, then reading these few slides for several times, spend some more time for this uh, particular example would be uh, help you helpful to to uh, understand the, the concepts here. Mm, think there is one. Uh, assignment question uh, that ask you to prove uh, that the solution, prove the solution for, for recurrences, uh, which is exactly the, the mathematical, uh, the substitution method that, in, that you need to use in, in assignments, uh, in assignment two, okay, which, which I think is the first question. Okay, so here uh, I listed several tips for uh, using the substitution method. So first of all, there's uh, no general solutions to uh, to find the, to to guess the correct solutions. Okay, all we can rely on is our uh, previous experience, our uh, observations. Um, Similar similar recurrences. Okay, so we can use some heuristics like uh, the recursion trees uh, to to help us uh, generate the, the the guess. Okay, so for example, 
if we look at this recurrence, which is in a more bizarre form, right? There's a n over two to the floor plus 17, which is a constant in there, right? Um, but if you look at, look at the function, it's not very different from the one for merge sorts and uh, maximum sub area, okay? Because this constant input is not that different from n over two. So we can guess that t of n equals big O of n times logarithm of n is still the solution, okay? So, but we can, we, then having this guess is the first step. Then we need to prove it, uh, use, use the substitution method, okay? All right. Um, so sometimes um, our guess, because due to the, the lack of information, our guess can be not as strong uh, as needed, okay? So in these cases, we can, what we can do is to revise the guess by subtracting a lower order term from our guess. So for example here, if our solution, if the recurrence looks like uh, T of N equals T of N over two to the floor uh, plus T of N over two uh, to the sale plus one, then we can, um, for example, our, the, 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 the first guess we made is uh, T of N equals uh, big O of N, all right? So what would be the consequence if we uh, substitute the gas? Then we can have this inequality, right? Because if we let T of this one to be smaller than uh, this condition, right? This second term is less than or equal to this term. So if we put these together, we have C times N plus one for T of N. And we also wish that C times N plus one should be smaller than C times N. But we soon notice that this is not possible, right? Because C, how come can a C plus one, a C times N plus one be smaller than C times N when C and N are all positive numbers, okay? So, this case means that our solution is not, uh, our guess is not a strong one. It's too, too, too wide or too broad or too general, okay? So we can be more specific, okay? So for example, we can try uh, a narrower hypothesis, okay? So we can subtracting a lower order term. For example, in this case, we can use T of N smaller than uh, C times N minus D as our solution, okay? So let's assume that this, is, this should be our solution and D is a constant. Then substituting this thing into the original equation would be something like this. This is the first term plus second term. And if we add them together, it will be C times N minus 2D plus one. And then if we want, because our goal is to show that this is smaller than C times N minus D, okay? because this is, this is the condition, this is how the mathematical uh, induction makes sense. We should infer from a smaller case to a bigger case, okay? So we wish this inequality to hold. Then all we need to do is to find the D that hold the inequality. When we eliminate C times N on each side, we will have that D should be greater than one. That means as long as we choose the D that is greater than one, then the mathematical induction is valid, okay? Which is the basis for our proof, okay? 
All right, so I think this tip is, uh, is uh, useful uh, when we are sometimes uh, just a little step away from the correct answer, okay? So, um, because technically speaking, this answer should be correct, okay? But it's just too broad. It's not strong enough. If we only use this term, like for example, only C times N as our guess, it's just not strong enough. So why we, what we need to do is, try, is to try a stronger uh, condition, which is the guess minus some lower order terms, okay? Which makes the uh, inequalities uh, solvable, okay? All right, so I think that's so much for the tips for substitution method. I think we can go to the next uh, section for recurrent tree method. So because this is uh, uh, compared to the substitution method, the recurrent tree method is much more intuitive and it will be really useful when we have no clues about uh, which form of function that we should guess uh, about the recurrence equations. All right, so we are not unfamiliar with this one because the first day we introduce, when we introduce the merge sort algorithm, we actually draw a recurrent tree already, all right? So the basic uh, goal here is to, to uh, come up with come up with a solution or come up with some uh, good guess that we can further use the further use the substitution method to prove okay um, it's just like what we did for how we analyze the merge sort well basically we need to uh, draw a tree and in such a tree, in such a recursion tree, each node represents the cost for a single subproblem. Okay. So, and if we sum up the cost within each level, uh, we should get uh, a per level cost. Okay. And then we can sum up all the levels in order to determine the total cost. So ultimately we need to sum up all the nodes together, but we will do that level by level because the levels will demonstrate some patterns that are helpful for, to, to solve the problem. Okay. All right, now let's look at this time a different example because we have solved the, the merge sort already. Now let's look at a different example and it'll make things uh, more interesting. Because if you uh, look at the recursion equations, it is not two times t of n over two, but it's three times uh, t of n over four, okay? So which is a uh, 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 little bit more complex case, okay? So let's, let's try to get a solution for this uh, mathematical, uh, for this uh, recurrence equation. So now let's tolerate some sloppiness. When, so whenever we have the, uh, the floors and the ceilings in the recurrences, if we just want to draw a tree in order to get some uh, not that accurate guess about the solution, it's okay if we ignore the floor or ceilings, okay? It doesn't make sense if we keep that floor ceilings in the equation, okay? All right. So what we would do is to put the Tn here and look at the coefficients before the right side, okay? It's three times T of n over four, okay? Which means the three here means we need to draw three branches, okay? And the C times N square is something we will put here in the node, in the root node, okay? And 
the each uh, item for each branch here is the t of n over four. Okay, it is uh, the sub problem. It is a solution. It is a cost for the sub problem. Okay, t of n over four. All right, that's the first level of split from level zero to level one. Now, if we do the next split, okay, this is a little bit tricky, okay? So if you look at the left mode, so this thing in the, in the, in the blue circle, okay? Let me clear a bit. So this thing in the blue circle, it is the results of expanding this T of N over four, okay? Because, if you use t of uh, n over four, according to the solution, according to recurrence, it should be three times t of n over four, uh, n over four. And plus c times n over n over four square. Okay, and this n over four square times c is exactly the the node here. Okay, so we can spend the all the three children nodes in the previous view. Okay, and to get a new, uh, a larger view for for the for the tree. All right. So the the sub problems getting smaller. Okay. Right? So that means we can do the split further and further until we uh, reach the the bottom level. Okay. So the bottom level is where we can no longer split the problems. Let's look at the next slide. Okay. We can keep splitting. Right. Keep spanning the tree. Keep growing the tree until we uh, hit something. But now we can start examining the levels for uh, the summation for per level. For example, the roots, it's of course C times N squared. And the second level, it's three identical items. If we put them together, three times C times N over four squared and which is n over 16 times c times n squared okay for the next level we have nine items nine identical items right and which is if we look at the the numbers here nine is just a three to the power of two and each node has such a value n over 16. So if we combine, if we put the, this all constant together, it is three over 16 to the power of two, right? Times C n squared. All right. So we can kind of guess for level I, right? Because for uh, level zero, it's this thing. For level one, it's this thing. For level two, it's this thing. So we can kind of get for level i, the summation should be uh, something related to i, right? It, it should be something like three to the three over sixteen to the power of i something. Okay, but we will uh, look at we will go confirm our guess later. So now our concern is when should the expand end? Okay. And what is, what is the exact number of levels in the tree? Because we want to know at which level the problem, the, the sub problem hits the smallest size, okay? So these are all the things we can uh, examine from the equation, from the recurrence equation. So we, our further observation tells us, tells that, the uh, size of subproblems actually decrease by a factor of four, right? If you look at the number in each node, 
in the root root node, it's n over uh, it's n square, and then it's n over four, right? Then it's n over n over sixteen, and sixteen is four square. So it's actually a decrease by a factor of four. Okay, so we can say that the size for the sub problem at the node uh, at the depth i or level i. Okay, so if we're looking at depth i, then the sub problem is this quantity. It is n over four to the power of i. Okay. And now remember the sub problem can never be infinitely small. There must be a minimum case, which is in this case, it is one, right? When it is the sub problem is the smallest case. So we need to make this quantity n to the n over four to the power i equals one. And when this hits one, we will see that by solving this equation, we can get i equals logarithm with base four of n. Okay. It basically means that at the depth logarithm base four of n, the sub problem hits the base case. We have the smallest sub problem. So because we start from the root and the root is something we, uh, we use level zero or use depth zero. So the depth actually uh, starts from zero to one, two, three, and two logarithm of base four of n, logarithm base four of n. So altogether, we have logarithm with base four of n plus one levels. And this plus one is outside the logarithm function, okay? All right, so now we have some useful information about the tree. We know that it has that many levels, okay? So now we just need to consider the summation of each level, okay? What about per level cost? We did that estimation in a one slide previously. Okay, but we're gonna do it again here. All right, so now we play, we, we plot the smallest case at the bottom, okay? So what we can observe is that, first of all, uh, in terms of the number of nodes, the root node has just one node. The, the second, the level one has three, which is three times more, right? So the level has three times more nodes than the, than the level above. That's something we can use. The number of nodes at depth i is three to the power of i. And if we look at the factor of reduce or factor of decrease, which is, which is all we, something we already know, it's a factor of four, right? So the node at each depth at depth i is c times n over four to the power of i squared, right? That's something we already know. So for each level for depth i or level i, the summation is three times three to the power of i times c times n over four to the power of i squared, okay? One quantity is the number of nodes, and the second quantity is the value in each node. So altogether, it is three over 16 to the power i times c times n squared. That's for depth i, right? That's for depth i. And we also have the information about how many levels are there. So the bottom level is a bit uh, is a bit special, okay? And the bottom level is at the depths i equals logarithm uh, with base four of n, right? And the number of leaf nodes is something we can compute, right? Three to the power of i, if we substitute this thing into i, we will have three to the power log four of n, and we uh, switch the position of three and n, it will be n to the power of log uh, four of three, okay? So 
this is a quantity that we will come across a lot in the future when we talk about master uh, theorem, okay? So this is quantity n to the power of uh, logarithm four of three is the number of leaf nodes, okay? And because each leaf node cost us uh, that amount of time, Q of one. And Q of one is usually a constant. So we can assume that the total cost for the bottom level is some constants times the number of subproblems, which is big theta of n to the power of uh, this logarithm value. Okay, that's for bottom level. And what about now for all the levels above, right? Above the bottom levels. Let's put everything together. Let's put everything together. So we have expressions for the per level summation for all the depths, for all the levels above the bottom level, right? Until we have, until we got the level that's above the bottom level, okay? That is a minus one here, right? That is the final level before the bottom level. Okay, because the bottom level is a special quantity. And the bottom level is, is written as the big theta of something and to the power of something. And all we need to do is to sum up all these level summations, per level summations. We need to sum up um, the C times N here, C times N square, this, this, Right, we just sum up all these items. So it is actually a geometric series, right? This part in the green part is a, is a, is a geometric series plus some big theta of something, okay? And this geometric series is actually solvable. It's actually simplifiable, right? We can uh, take the C times N square out, okay? Now let's use the formula for a geometric series. If we take the C times uh, N square out and we are sum up the geometric series for I ranges from zero to uh, log four of N minus one. And each term is uh, three over 16 to the power of I. And this is, can give us a pretty, pretty uh, easy solution. Right, using the geometric series uh, formula. All right. Oops. So now let's, given this summation, we let's look at the <clears throat> upper bound of this function. Okay. We want to check the property of the geometric series. So it's basically. Uh, use the limits, right? We, we, because the series can no longer, can, can, cannot be infinitely long, right? This quantity must be, uh, upper limit must be bounded by this infinity. So when N approaches infinity, the geometric series can be estimated, right? So this one can become approaching zero, which is, which makes the whole numerator becomes uh, negative one. And we further do the simplification it becomes uh, a quadratic function with this coefficient times uh, plus the big theta of this quantity, okay? And if we look at the coefficients here, the index, uh, power index, one a log, log with base four of three, it's almost a 0.79 something. It's smaller than one, right? It's, 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 a, it's a polynomial function, but uh, with lower order, than this quadratic uh, function. So put these two terms here, the left term is a higher order term, which means it's a de de determinant term. And then we can confidently claim that this T of N has an upper bound of quadratic function, okay? Because it can be expressed as this, uh, Compound, compound terms, compound mathematical terms. Uh, and the first term basically 
is the result of a geometric series. So that's how we come up with the guess for the solution, uh, the guess of the solution for these uh, recurrence equations. Okay, and because it's just a guess, we 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 use some uh, we use some sloppiness, right? We use some uh, by removing these floor symbols by. Uh, replacing the big C notation with C times N something. So uh, we, if we want to strictly verify the guess, we still need to use the substitution method, right? So we want to prove that these uh, quadratic upper bounds uh, holds for some constant D such that uh, T of N is bounded by d times n squared for some n zero, okay? For all n that's greater than some n zero. So note that we use uh, d instead of c because a c appears before. The c is used in the uh, formula of t of n. So we should not, we should not duplicate the two, two, two uh, uh, constants. So, all we need to show using substitution method, right, is to uh, prove that these, if we substitute this t of n over four with d of n over four square plus c uh, times n square, we want it to be smaller than d of n, right? That is the mathematical induction. We want we want this inequality also holds, okay? And we find that as long as the D is greater than 16 over 13 times C by solving this inequality, this, quality, this inequality will always hold, okay? Which means uh, the substitution method kind of proved uh, the guess because we can always find the constants that satisfy this condition, okay? Which means, uh, we are uh, the the guess that we obtained uh, by drawing the recursion trees uh, is is a correct one. Okay, but the uh, remember for for a complete substitution method, we still need to find a boundary case, which is the n zero. Okay, but that is uh, something we uh, something we uh, can always find uh, as long as the solution is correct one. All right, so uh, I think we have some time to check a more uh, interesting example, uh, which is an unbalanced recurrent tree, okay? Um, so, so far, the previous tree is a three branch per level, per node, right? Uh, but uh, each branch has the same node in the, in the resulting Trojan node. So uh, let's see, what about a unbalanced recurrent tree? Could it be a different case? Okay. If we do the first split, right? It's uh, T of N over three uh, on the left and T of N, two times N over three on the right. And if we do the uh, further split, you will find that, okay, at level two, it's already very unbalanced distributions of values, right? It's uh, n over nine, two times n over nine, two times n over nine, and four times n over nine. So those values are, are not evenly distributed per level, okay? So if we look at the per sum, Per level summation, it's actually quite interesting. It's the it's the same amount for each level, right? But the thing with this type of tree is that the different branches they grow in a different speed. Okay, so if we let if we look at a level here, all those values they are uh, in the nodes are not um, evenly distributed, which means the right branch grows, uh, um, the, the values decreases slower, right? While some nodes 
for example, the leftmost nodes will hit the smallest case early because it decreases really fast. When the right one is eight times n over 27, the, the leftmost one is already n times uh, n over 27. So this is very, very, very uh, uh, unbalanced uh, growth speed. Okay. So if we consider the longest path from the root node to the leaf, which is the rightmost branch, right? So it decreases with a factor of two over three, right? When, when this quantity, when two over three to the power of i times n hits one, then i is this quantity, okay? So the height of this tree should be this one because this is the longest, uh, longest uh, pass, okay? But it, so if it is a binary tree, so if say all branches are the same length, then we can use C times N, which is the summation for each level, okay? So because if you go to the previous slide, we find that each level has the same summation. So if the tree is very balanced, then we can use C times N times the logarithm uh, three over two of N as the total summation at the total cost. But this is not a binary case and it has much fewer leaf nodes uh, and many of the internal nodes are absent. Okay, so the per level summation is not necessarily C times N. So uh, this, Estimation is actually a not an accurate estimation. Okay, so what we want to show in the next slide that is that even this guess, this big O of n times logarithm of n, is not a, an accurate guess. We can still use it. Okay, we can still use it to uh, as a kind of a guess which we can prove to be, uh, to start with in the substitution method, okay? So we should use substitution method to verify this guess, right? And it turns out that if we use uh, several steps of substitution, we will soon find that, okay, if we spend the logarithms, into this uh, subtraction of logarithms, this, uh, I think this one should be subtraction, not uh, summation, okay? We should uh, soon observe that if we want this quantity to be, uh, if we want the last inequality to hold, then we must satisfy that the D should be greater than this quantity. So it may look a complex term, but it's an analytical solution, which means as long as D is greater than this quantity uh, than C, then we can always have the mathematical induction valid, okay? Which means this big O of N times uh, logarithm of N is actually the correct solution, okay? So through all these slides from the previous one to this one, uh, the main point is that uh, even though when the tree is not a perfect balanced tree, when we draw the tree recursion, the recursion tree plots, it can still provide useful information about what would be the total cost. Okay. We can use the guess as the start point to use substitution method to do the fully uh, proof, okay? All right, so I think we are done with the two sections for substitution and the recursion method. So for the next lecture, we're gonna use, uh, introduce master method as a general way, or it's a general solution to, uh, uh, recurrence equations uh, that are re that results from the mass, uh, from the divide and conquer algorithms. Okay, so I think you can start working on some of the problems in the 
second assignment, which I think is due next week. And if you have questions, uh, you can let me know by email or you can send me, you uh, can come to the office hours. So it's uh, quite a lot of math today. Um, some of those are uh, uh, related to the geometric series. I would encourage you to go through some of the key steps on the paper, especially the ones related to the, to the trees. And once you have worked out the relationship between the depths I and the value in each node and the number of nodes per level, I think uh, the whole picture would be more complete for you. Oh, right. Let me stop recording now.